news of you over the last few weeks, Campbell, and uh, I think the politics has been pretty well covered. Um, what I'm interested in, I guess, is to tease out some of the personal of them a bit more. Um, I noticed um, a bit earlier on, you're looking very lean. In fact, um, uh, you can show off your lane over uh, a little bit of space, I uh, think. Uh, did you go for a run this morning? Yes, I did. You did? As you do every morning? As I do most mornings. Yeah. But no, no, um, you know, people are always telling me you've lost weight. I, I actually haven't. In fact, well. I'll, no, I'll probably put on some, actually. Given the lecture. You so, said so, the fitness lecture. So <laughs> what is it about you and running, and not just you and running, but Tony Abbott and running? Uh, in fact, Queensland Premiers uh, seem to have a habit of it. Anna Bly claimed to be a runner. I'm not sure whether that was ever I, I don't think my, uh, uh, my good friend Peter Beattie was really <laughs> into Wayne, it that much. Wayne, Wayne Goss used to run in from uh, Sunnybanks. Yeah, that's those. true. Oh, look, you know, you just got to keep fit. And I suppose um, one of the ways that I got through, um, you know, um, seven years in, in, as the Lord Mayor and then three years as Premier was keeping fit because, um, you know, you really, you know, it clears the head and it, and it, and it, and it you know, it's sort of, it just does so many positive things for you. You've got to keep, you've so got to keep it's fit. it's just a health thing. Yeah. It's a health thing, so yeah. it's not a habit you picked up in the Army? Oh, I suppose that in, entrenched that, but um, you know, I've got plenty of army friends that, that haven't continued with it. Yes, I, I won't, I won't, uh, I won't draw out Peter, who's here today, but he's got an excuse. I won't go into that, Peter. So, and it's okay every day, is that? No, 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 no. Actually, there's a really, there's a really good catalyst uh, uh, show on the ABC in recent days. I tried that this morning, and it's this: you run for 30 seconds flat out up a hill. And then you have four and a half minutes off, and you do that. You do that four times, uh, and that's it. I can tell you now, it sounds easy, doesn't it? It's really hard. So you've been trying that. I tried that this morning for the first time. And Come I on, ask Gavin what he. Did. Well, I heard all about it. So. <laughs> so, 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 so this book wasn't done on the run. No. The two of you didn't go out running. Oh, we did. Oh, we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, there were a couple. Of, probably our best interviews were done when we were running, uh, and because. Uh, Campbell runs quite fast, so I don't remember any of the interviews <laughs> earlier on the book. But, um, but no, it's um, yeah, and a bit of the routine, I think. You know, Cam's, I think um, Lisa's, Lisa's dad has, uh, has a you know, lovely quote in the book about um, you know, Campbell's uh, very determined pursuit of Lisa. Uh, he wasn't to be undeterred in his pursuit uh, of Lisa, but he brought um, a lot of the, you know, the, the good qualities from, from, those, from those days and you know, punctuality. Um, is, is one thing, you know, just good appearance and probably running, you know, the routine is, is a part of that too, I think. But you've got to win, haven't you, Campbell? Isn't that the story? Of What's that? Name? Some of your cabinet colleagues couldn't come with you. No, no, that up. wasn't, no, no. That's just, not true? No, not true. It's in the books. Well, I beat him. I beat him numerous occasions. No, no, that wasn't about winning, though. <laughs> okay, so... I've, I've I'm actually, I, I'm it. actually not. No, I'm not a mad, com I'm not a mad competitor. I'm, really, I'm not. Okay, well, I've, you know, I've been fascinated by politicians that can get up before dawn, go for a run and then function all day, and then do that all over again. Well, you certainly can't do it at the end of the day. You'll, you'll never have time. And I, you know, I think it says something about, about character. I think it says something about discipline. Um, I wonder whether it said something about tradition in terms of taking the army on. Um, I have to say, uh, reading your book, uh, Barack Obama's second book was called The Audacity of Hope. Um, I think your book should have just been called Audacity. Um, you got out of the army because you didn't want to stand in line. And every other job that you've taken since, you started at the top without any previous experience really in that role. You had a bit of experience when you came to be Premier. You certainly weren't a member of Parliament. Um, sort of David and Goliath type thing. You know, David turns up and he says, oh, I'm not going to use those swords, and that guy's a bit bigger, but I'll take these stones. You know, very audacious, but he'd been, um, he'd, he'd had the, the oil put on him, he'd been anointed. What gave you the self belief to take these things on that you'd never done before? Well, it, it, was, it was more that, um, it, it was more what spurred me on to do it. I suppose there are two, there's two bits in the book that Gavin's covered two separate funerals. Uh, something about funerals for, for introspection. So the first funeral is my father's in 1999 in Canberra. And um, uh, I'm sitting there in this church, and they're talking about my father who's just died, and my mum's a cabinet minister, John Howard's there, um, Whitlam was there, and Fraser, um, and people saying nice things about Dad. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know what, I'm, I'm a businessman, I was, um, I was 
just about to turn uh, 36 and I was successful in my business career. I was making, um, for the record of the journalists here, I was making more money than I ever made probably in the whole time I was Lord Mayor, that's for sure. And I thought, well, life's not about money. And I thought, um, you know, you know, here's Dad. He, he served. Dad's career entirely was service. You know, he just he was in the army. Then he was, um, then he was a he was a federal minister and and, a, and, a, and an MP. And then when he when he when he was out of government, he then was serving in a whole range of things. And I thought, well, you know, life's more about that, more than more than just yourself. I said, I'm not. In, I think I'm not involved in in any sort of service. No, no service club. My kids. P and F, etc. And so I thought, well, if something comes up one day, I'll, I'll put my hand up. Anyway, fast forward then um, about three, almost three years, actually two and a half years, and we're out to dinner for um, a Valentine's Day dinner, and there was Lisa and myself, uh, her brother, um, and uh, our sister-in-law, and uh, Sebastian said, oh, look, the Liberal Party are looking for a candidate for the Lord Meralty. And I didn't say anything. And I turned to Lisa, who was to my right, Seb was to my front, and to her eternal regret, she spoke first. And she said, you could go for that. So she anointed you. Yes. <laughs> and so it's for everything, it's for, for everything that happened after that was her fault. So that was the, that was the first so, funeral. So hang on. So, but, so, so hang on. When you decide... Oh, oh, you can't give a right of reply. Yes, that's exactly right. I get a right of reply. You're not saying what was on your face when you turned Oh, yeah, that's... It was a Valentine's... I say this over and over. It was a Valentine's dinner, and the sparkle in his eye was not for me. <laughs> I think so we should move on. So hang on, no, no, we're not going to move on at all. So Lisa gave you permission that time round, but what shocked me was to read in the paper and then to have it confirmed when I read the book that you didn't tell her for three weeks or thereabouts after you made up your mind to run for Premier that you were going to do it. How did that happen? Um, you know, this was a captain's pick that you weren't prepared to run past the Minister for Home Affairs. <laughs> well, that's something that um, um, you know, was, was pretty bad, um, and I've, I've acknowledged that, obviously. The were you just absorbed? Yeah. No, well, or were you worried she'd beat her? It was, it was sort of a busy time. <laughs> Uh, sorry, that was a joke. She wasn't um, office next door when you no, discussed this. I well, what, well, what happened was that I was referring before to a, a second funeral. So the second funeral was at the Albert Street Uniting Church, uh, and and uh, I was there with Ben Myers and Mark Brody, who's here today, and uh, it was uh, the, the the funeral for the, the husband of a, of a mutual friend, and I was sitting there thinking about what was going on in state politics. Uh, I'd been, um, you know, I'd been sort of again contemplating what I was doing, where I was going. I'd actually made a decision not to stand again in 2012 for the Lord Melty. So this was January ish, January, January 2011. I decided I wasn't going to stand again. And I thought, look, we've got a really bad state government, and I think they're going to win the election. I think Anna Bly is going to call the election. She's going to call it between now and June. And in fact, I'd spoken to Tim Nichols, who's not here today. I'd spoken to him about uh, in the previous four or five days, one night going home, and this was the aftermath of the floods. And Tim said, I'll never forget it. I can actually show you on the ICB where I was. And Tim said, Cam, I think it's a game changer in terms of what's happened because the Premier at the time got a huge p a bounce in the polls. And I'm sitting there thinking, I just can't stand by and see another train wreck election um, and uh, where, where they get across the line. So I said when we were outside the church, I said to Mark, I said to Ben, come back to the office. We went back to the office half a block away in the temporary city hall digs and walked right past Lisa and locked the door yeah. and well it's all in the book and I guess that's where the, the scheming started, if I can put it that way. Um, and I guess events sort of crept up on us and then Spencer Jolly broke the story and then we were no longer in control of events, and it was either say you're going to do it or not. And at that point, you know, it was too late to tell tell Lisa. But I suppose it was pretty bad not to tell your wife or ask her. She probably would have said no. 
so yeah, that was a, a, a bone of contention for some time and then compounded by what she had to go through during the campaign. Mm. Yeah, so, um, what was your experience of politics growing up in your family? Like, if your father, there's some interesting parallels between you and your father. Um, he um, ran for the seat of Bass in the Bass by election, which some people may remember. Um, there was a 14.3% swing to the, uh, the Liberal Party and Herald at the end of the Whitlam government. But I don't think anyone expected him to win the seat when he got the press election. He was an outsider, never owned politics before, only recently come to, uh, to uh, Tasmania. Um, so that was a pretty audacious thing to do, which paid off. And you were about 12, almost 12 at the time. So you're in that sort of formative period. What did you pick up from all that? Well, I suppose just very quickly in terms of politics, um, people always used to say to me, oh, you've come from a political family, you must know about it. I've got to say, and people won't believe me, but I really didn't have a clue um, about it. I did not really understand what it was all about. Um, and uh, I, I guess um, there was a big learning curve anyway. Um, having said that, I had an enthusiasm for what my parents were doing. Going back to your, your, your thing, if I can just touch on a bit of stuff that's in the book, there's some really interesting tales there about politics and the family. I mean, there's my late grandfather, uh, you know, my, my, my maternal grandfather, uh, Mum's dad, who in 1952 found a loophole in the State Electoral Act. So he's a, he was a solicitor in, 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 in Melbourne. He actually stood for two seats at the same time in the 1952 Victorian state election. And we've got a photo of the how to vote card. Another thing that's interesting that's in the book is that Dad was the commanding officer of the 5th Battalion at uh, Holes with the Army Barracks. And in 72, he invited the local federal member to come and speak to the officers um, at the mess about um, defence policy because he was the leader of the opposition. His name was Gough Whitlam. And um, uh, Whitlam, after that, that, that thing, well, he impressed everyone, by the way. And he then, there's a letter that he wrote, which didn't make the book, sadly, ran out of space. Um, and he, he, there's, a, there's a letter we found where Whitlam was talking about the visit. Um, then, Mum and, well, Dad definitely went in and voted for Whitlam in the 72 election, and I'm pretty sure Mum did too. But by 74, they were completely you know, appalled by what was going on and they were firmly against him and that's how they were, they were radicalised, if I can put it they were, that way, they were energised about the mistakes of that government, which today is being rewritten as some sort of fantastic government. You know, it's, isn't it a fascinating history? You've got to write the history, don't you, Gavin? <laughs> you know, and it, you know, you know, people who supported him in 72... Oh, and the other thing, did we put this in the book? Mum actually applied to be Whitlam's mm. advisor yeah, yeah. For, for women's affairs. So by, by, by 74, barely 18 months yeah, later, yeah. they had changed their views. So I just want people to dwell on that today. But yeah, it was, it was very audacious and an exciting time. So if you didn't have much to do with politics, does that mean that your dad was more or less a bit absent and that your mum was...? Oh, he, dad was away a heck of a yeah. lot, and I and suppose. But yeah, but we... Modern, wasn't she, and that she got a law degree? Oh, mum, mum. Yeah, she yeah, had, she, she had was... her own practice. Yeah, yeah. And she actually supported the family while yeah. your father ran for, yeah. uh, for Bass. At university, she family. was a member. I don't know if um, Sarah knows this one, but because she's an engineering <laughs> student, but... Uh, Mum was a member of the Society for the Suppression of Immoral Impulses and Engineering Students. <laughs> at, um, <laughs> true story, yeah. That sort of ring chimes uneasily with the story of uh, the landlord telling Kevin to get Yeah, yeah he exactly. All they were married. Well, he wasn't an engineer, yeah. <laughs> so, what sort of an influence on you as your mother? Oh, great influence. Um, you know, I think actually, to a large extent, on my mother's son. And this, again, is one of the reasons I wanted to do the book. Again, I don't recognise the person who's in that book. The person who's in that... Sorry, the person who's in, in the media, the person who's in the cartoons and the Courier Mail in the last four years, is not someone that my mum would be particularly proud of. And it's not me. Um, so my mum was an advocate for um, uh, sort of women's rights. She was a member of the women's electoral lobby back in, in 72, 73. She founded the first uh, women's shelter in Tasmania, which I think has co yeah. covered a bit of that. Um, Anne Henderson talks about that in her book. Yeah. Um, you know, Mum used to come home and tell us these terrible stories of domestic violence. That's why I got Quentin Bryce to come in 
you know, last year, about this time last year, and, and do the report into it because I was so passionate about it. So I'm a mother's son, particularly. Right. And when you first won in the City Council, you won the Lord Mayoralty, but it was a mayoralty that was elected at large. The Labor Party won the, the majority of seats. Um, so you had to negotiate with them. Um, you also had some uh, cross-party friendships. The book relates uh, how you and Peter Vitti, uh, he used to waddle him and he used to run up to the top of the hill somewhere in winter and uh, he dispensed uh, advice to you and uh, you'd swap some ideas. Uh, you, at one stage called Paul Lucas, your uh, um, uh, case officer. That's right, yeah. Uh, and you've got a friend, friendship with Terry McEnroe. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah by, the, by the end of your term in Parliament, people saw you as divisive, unable to work with anyone dictatorial or fascist and so on. What happened between that term in council, where you were quite successful in yep. getting, getting your, your uh, um, policies through against overwhelming numbers, and what happened to state government? Well, I guess a simple answer that you might not believe is nothing changed and nothing happened. It was the politics of personal denigration, uh, and this is covered in the book. Um, and I've said this a few times, I think I said it on the radio today, so, and I said it to Lee Sales on the ABC the other night. So in 2011, I was the popular Lord Mayor who just got us through the floods. I was the same guy all the way through 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, except a particular narrative had been ruthlessly exploited on, on my character. Um, so it's the same guy, but same, same outlook. And that's not entirely true because I have said to Gavin, and it's in the book, that I was very angry in 2012 into 2013 about what had happened to me. So I fess up to that, and I probably affected my demeanour. But, um, you know, I was the same guy trying to do the things for the community, trying to actually serve the community. And the reason I became unpopular, twofold, one, they were a unpopular policy decisions and things we had to put up. And I used to say to journalists all the time, why would we be doing this, ladies and gentlemen? We're not silly. We know this isn't popular, but it actually has to happen for the good of, of all Queenslanders, particularly for the long-term good. But the other thing that happened is that, and this is one of the things that happens today with politics, is if you stand up night after night and say about your opponent, they're arrogant and secretive, arrogant and secretive, night after night, mm. I'm afraid today, and the journalists are here, that's what, ladies and gentlemen, you then dutifully cover. Um, uh, we weren't. And indeed, I'll just quickly be a little bit more political. Um, we were accused of a range of things uh, by Mr Fitzgerald. Um, I notice he's been absolutely silent since the sittings of Parliament were curtailed. Uh, he's been absolutely silent when the Premier doesn't even turn up to estimates. Now, I'm raising these things because he had things to say about these issues. He, he hasn't said anything about the fact that the Premier didn't even turn up to estimates. Uh, he said nothing when all this talk about bipartisan appointments of the Crime and Corruption Commission chair had been a feature of our government, but he was silent when the, the now government decided at the end of the day just to roll over the top of the opposition and the independents. Um, I think there was another one as well. Uh, well, well, we've got a we've got a, a police minister who arguably should have stood down under the Westminster, Westminster system some time ago. So there's a few examples, and you know, you know, you you know, you could mount the same negative campaign against individuals in the state government that exists today. Um, I suppose the, the current state opposition has chosen not to engage in, in that sort of thing. Whether that's a good or bad thing politically will, remains to be seen. Okay, well, we might just take a, a few questions. We're running a little bit behind time, but has anyone got, well, I'm getting ahead. Has anyone got a question to ask? Yep. Over here. Yeah. Oh, it's Des. Des. <laughs> He's a guest. He's a guest, okay. <laughs> We've reserved questions for you, not for the journalists. They get their, their turn over there or at the um, front of the building. But Des is a guest. Uh, Honestly, who do you think will win the next election in Queensland? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can only go by the polling today, and, and you know, at the moment, it would you would think that um, the Labor Party would win. Um, but you know, it's a long time to an election. But I do say that just think about that for a moment. Uh, we've got a we've got a government that's doing well in the polls, but I don't see what they've done in eight months. 
Okay, I just don't see what they're doing. But today, and I say to the journalists who are here, do you want good government or do you want good politics? And I have a belief that we elect people for good government. If we want good schools, hospitals that work, if we don't want a huge burden of taxes, then we have to celebrate good government. And if people are doing things that are difficult politically, perhaps give them credit for the things they're trying to do. And Malcolm Turnbull will be trying to do those things. And I hope he's successful in having this conversation. Sadly, I already see people suggesting that he's taking too long to explain things, being long-winded. Well, you can't, you can't talk about complex issues in an increasingly complex society and just be, give simplistic one word or 10 second grab answers. It just doesn't work that way. Okay, well don't take too long though. Uh, <laughs> any other questions? Can I just say? Hi Ken, uh, Wendy Francis. It seems to me that we are becoming ungovernable um, because we, we want what we want and we don't want to be led. So can, is there a comment that you can make on that? Well, I, I say to people in this room, um, don't just take my word for, uh, for it in terms of my, this concern we're expressing in the book. Um, take uh, note of what Paul Kelly's been saying, not just two weeks ago, but for the last two years or so, uh, about the state of politics in Australia. And there are other people saying it as well. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, I just say to you that you know, look at what he said, and he's saying that there is something wrong with, with the political debate in the nation and what's going on. Again, I go back to five prime ministers in five years. You know, what has changed? Well, in my view, what has changed is the way it's been covered by the media. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. It's social media, and it's the way the community are seeing it as well. And, you know, I... I I just don't think we're dealing with a nation with the issues that we've, we've, we've got, and I can expand on that. But <coughs> if if one, someone wants to ask me a follow-up. Follow Graham, I've actually got a question for Gavin. Good. What weren't you allowed to put in the book? <laughs> you'll, you'll have to talk to my lawyers. <laughs> Good no, no, we had, we had some... There were no, there were no topics off-limits um, with, with Campbell, um, but there, there was some really cool stuff that I had to take out. For, uh, for defamation purposes, um, um, unfortunately. Uh, but no, look, I, 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 I've said it in interviews, but I, I think people will be quite surprised um, by, by the admissions. I mean, you read an autobiography, um, for example, if someone writes an autobiography, it's often, you know, it's their version of history and they've probably had years of being written about from, from other people's perspective. It's, uh, an autobiography is their chance to tell their story and uh, very often autobiographies perhaps aren't as as raw and honest, and, and uh, certainly not as raw and honest, I think, as, as, as this book is. Um, but, you know, I was, I was a combatant. You know, I was, I was involved, and I, you know, I think we were a good government that got the politics wrong. Um, and, and, of course, that, you know, my, my perspective comes through in the book, um, as well as Campbell's. Uh, Campbell, Stephen Bowers, uh, and thank you for your service to the state. Um, my question is, if there was one thing in your time as Lord Mayor or Lord Premier uh, that you could change, what would you do? Apart from the initial decision? Or? Um, I, I think there's probably a range of things that... I, I, I don't have too many regrets about um, the Lord Mayoralty, I've got to say. Mm. Um, a bit difficult to say, it's probably... I could give the glib answer and say, buy the book. Um, that'll probably cover that. I, I would, I'd say it's, it's, it's probably the, the tough decisions and the way that we, we sort of, we actually explain them. There, you know, I think Julie Bishop once said, the thing about politics is that you're one sentence away from career oblivion or words to that effect. And there were, you know, there were, there were things there that, that just, that, 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 were, that were seized upon as emblematic. I mean, I'll take one that, that's topical today. Um, and it's trivial, actually. It is trivial. It's, you know, we, there, was, there was 20 or $40,000 for the, the literary awards, the Premier's literary awards. So let's just have a look at this. The, the Premier's literary, literary awards were not cancelled, not banned. Um, we simply took away some sponsorship because 
the authors that were getting the awards in the last few years up to then weren't even from, you know, weren't typically from Queensland, weren't even turning up to collect their prize. We wanted to save money. We were cutting corporate boxes and entertainment and all sorts of stuff like that. Party. And, and, and um, we said, okay, well, we'll cut that. But my gosh, you know, and, and today we have even we have five to six bookshops across Australia at least that we know of who just can't let it go. It's a they won't sell you the book because you know because of that supposedly. Well, you know, there, there's just an example. I mean, it was in hindsight um, a really really unfortunate decision, and it just it just was used against us constantly by people who wanted to sort of paint a particular picture. By the way, the wards continued. They did exactly what we wanted them to do, which was go out and get private spec sector sponsorship, and they went from strength to strength. But, and I'm getting a bit on my soapbox here, what was that, how was that used? Well, the picture that's been painted in that sector, if I can put it that way, is that he's against books. He doesn't like literature. <laughs> can't read. Yeah, he can't read. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. It's so come to our house, you know, you walk into the hallway and there's my books from wall to, to, to floor to ceiling. Um, so that's an example. There were other ones as well um, uh, in terms of things that happen along the way. Another, another big one would be, and it's covered extensively in the book, is the issue of Tim Carmody. Okay? Tim Carmody is the right guy for the job. Tim Carmody was the right guy for the job and why? I say rhetorically, ladies and gentlemen, is the legal and court system in Queensland, indeed Australia, is it affordable? Is it timely and efficient? Do we get the most performance from our judicial officers and our courts? The answer is a resounding no. Do people have full confidence in the decisions of certain magistrates at the moment? I think the Courier Mail has covered this one pretty extensively, one person in particular. No, they don't. <laughs> Um, is there a need for reform in the courts and the legal system? Well, I talk to lawyers who are the more honest lawyers who pro in terms of their, their, their profession and they say there is need for reform. That's why Carmody was put there. But was it a good political decision? Well, Tim Nichols was against it. It's covered in the book. Um, uh, Ian Walker was against it. Ben Myers was against it. Ben Myers, bless his cotton socks, dutifully went and rip raided his diary. <laughs> that was Ben. He wrote a note to himself. But sort of a bad decision, and he was right. So there you go. So there, there, are, there are two things I'd take back. Okay, well, this is a, um, a school day, so we'll have to go back to work. I've just got one question to uh, wind it up. Um, you've talked about funerals a bit. Um, what would you like your epitaph to be? And bear in mind, epitaphs are short, Campbell. <laughs> Oh, I've I've got no no idea, Read the book. but I can tell you where I want to. I can tell you where I want to be. I want to be. I want my ashes to be scattered under a tree, uh, where my father's ashes uh, are scattered, uh, near uh, on the side of Mount Pleasant in the Royal Military College, Duntroon. That's where I want to end up. So I'll tell you that. Campbell Newman, thank you very much.